Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Amen. Let's get into the book of Galatians. We finished up last week. If you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise in the end of chapter four, 3. Moving into chapter 4. Now, again, <clears throat> the... The premise upon, upon which Paul is writing this letter is um, there are Judaizers, and remember we say chapter 3 starts out, oh you dear idiots of Galatians, that's J.B. Phillips' translation, oh you foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you, uh, you know, and basically, you know, turning from, the, from grace and faith back to the law. The, the premise upon which this letter is written is that Judaizers have entered in and saying that faith in Jesus Christ alone is not enough for your salvation. That you still must adhere to the tenets and dictates and ordinances of the law in order to have a complete salvation. Amen. So they would say, they're saying things like, you, even though you're saved by grace, you still must be circumcised for a full salvation. You still have to observe the days of the month. You still have to do certain ordinances of the law and to be saved. Okay? This is where Paul is writing from, this position. Of, of, of uh, an apologetic, you know, what we call apologetics is defending the faith. Defending the faith in, in apologetics on the, the premise that there are Judaizers who've been entered in trying to say that faith in Jesus Christ alone is not enough, that you must also, men, be circumcised and do other things to, have a, be, to be fully accepted before God. And this is error. It's absolute error. It's faith and faith alone. Where the, where the people who teach excessive grace come in is, they don't, they don't take that premise in what Paul's saying. They just simply say, you know, that you don't do anything. There's no commandments. You, you know, you know we, we don't, that, that, that if you're saved and you got great under grace, it doesn't matter what you do, you're saved. And that's not what Paul says. Paul, when, when Paul's saying things, you know, don't, we don't obey the law, he's, he's talking in reference to we do not have to be circumcised or do whatever else to complete our salvation. It is complete through faith in Jesus Christ by his grace and that alone. Amen. However, there's enough here and we, when we go and read this last three chapters to understand that it is not a matter of that because you're under grace, you are permitted to do anything you want to do. You're under grace, which empowers you to do what God wants you to do. Big difference in some of the things that's being preached. Some are preaching it doesn't matter what you do because you're under grace. The truth is, is, it does matter what you do, but you are empowered to do right because you're under grace. You still have to do it. All right, so chapter 4, verse 1, Now I say that the heir, as, a ch as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. But he is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so, we, which we, when we were children, were in bondage unto the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth the son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that he might receive the adoptions of sons. Now, he is making a reference, an allegorical reference to the children of Israel, which were the heirs through the promise that when Jesus were to come, they would, they would, be, you know, they would walk in this to redeem them that were under the law. They were under the law, couldn't live by it, that he might receive the adoption as a son. And because you are, son, you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, or Daddy, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God, through Christ. Through Jesus Christ, we've been elevated out of the status of servanthood as mere servants of, of God and to sons of God. Amen. How be it then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them which were by, by nature are no gods. Uh, but now after you have known God, or rather known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye deserve days and months and times and years. See, they're trying to, they, they're, they're, they, see, you can't revert back to the flesh to please God. You have to live out of your spirit. The new creation, the new man lives out of his spirit, not out of the flesh. And this is the big difference. And this, if, if people who are teaching some of the things in the body of Christ are teaching today would teach that we're to live out of our spirit and be empowered by God's grace to live out of our spirit and to do what God wants us to do, and it doesn't get us saved because we are saved, that empowered, we're empowered to do that. 
instead of trying to say that you know, uh, you know that you can do anything you want to and it doesn't matter, that's just that's just error. But not doing or, or living by a bunch of laws and ordinances and not obs- and observing this and, and not observing that, or whatever, doesn't save you. You and you're not redeemed because you went on, you did, you went to meet in the assembly on the Sabbath. You're not redeemed because you're circumcised. All right? You're not redeemed because you went to Israel and took a, a, spot, a spotless lamb to the high priest and had it offered. That doesn't redeem you. It didn't redeem them. It covered their sin for one year. Okay? But once you're born again, you're to live out of your spirit, not out of your flesh. But you can't revert back to the flesh thinking that's what brings your salvation to you. And I jumped and just lost. There we go. You observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you. Lest I bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you. Be as I am. For I am as you are. You have not injured me at all. You know that through the infirmity of the flesh, I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation which was in my flesh, ye despise not. Nor are rejected, but receive me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of, for I bear you a record, that if you had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me? Now, you know, there's the, this is where a lot of uh, theologians and people try to come up with and say that Paul had ophthalmia, and you know that he had this runny, pussy uh, discharge in his eyes and all this kind of stuff. It was an oriental eye disease, and it was, a, it was a grotesque, whatever. You know, uh, and then there's others who say, you know, that this is about the time that Paul went to them. He had been stoned and left for dead. And, uh, you, know, he, he, you know, if you've been stoned and left for dead, you, don't, you probably don't look real good. Okay, now I don't believe, you know, and of course they got a, a letter on the book where he says, see how I write a lot, such a large letter. So he, he couldn't hardly see, he was in such bad shape with that Oreo line disease, he had to write huge letters. I mean, what did they carry, a, a horse and buggy full of one letter scrolls? You know, people get silly with their stupidity. Anyway, um, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me, unto me. I am therefore become your enemy. Now, one moment, what's he saying here is, your love for me is so strong, you would, have, you would have given yourself for me to help me. And now have I become your enemy? And now, am I now against you? Okay? Um, because I tell you the truth. It is amazing how when you tell the truth, people will turn on you. In my years of pastoring, the people who get the most ticked off with you are the ones you tell the truth to. Should I marry them? I don't think you should. You're the ex. I mean, we need to ex- cast the devil out of Pastor Ed. He told us he didn't think we should get married. Yeah. Now I just tell him if you're going to be dumb, you ought to be tough. Now, anyway. You know, you, I mean, I want to know the truth. I want to know you tell them the truth, and they're, they're furious with you. You tell them what the truth is, and they get so mad. Hello? I mean, they can't even see straight. They get so mad. Well, Paul experienced the same thing. Am I now your enemy now that I, just because I told you the truth? Hello? We had, you know, remember I talked about the guy who came into the church, and you know, he wanted to meet with me, and I told him that he was wrong. And, 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 and he got mad. He got mad and left. And, and listen, he, he didn't have to. He could have stayed and sat under the word and got straightened out. But I told him not to share it with anybody. Next thing, he shared with everybody he could find in the church to share it with. They were calling me on the phone. Did you know so-and-so was sharing, going around telling people in the church this? After about the third phone call, I'm like, I told him not to tell anybody that. You know, the Holy Spirit's not a person. You know, um, all kinds of stuff. You know, the, the, the parable of the mustard seed, the, the birds that, let, that nest in the lodge, the limbs, the lodge, and, and the limbs of the tree are demon spirits. And I mean, somebody was dropping the acid when they came up with that doctrine. People, you go tell them and say, no, the Bible, the Bible doesn't say that, it says this. And people get mad with you. Hello? Are y'all here? You go home. We think about me dating so and so. All he's trying to do is get in your pants. Hello? And then everybody gets mad with you. Then they come out later, you were right. Well, they're too late now. He done been there. Hello? Well, it's so. 
They all get mad at you. Well, you know, Paul's saying here, have I become your enemy because I told you the truth? And that's what happens a lot of times, because they don't want to hear the truth. You can't handle that truth. <laughs> but the truth is, you need me on that wall. You want me on that wall. I'm a few good men. All right, hallelujah. Did I just do all that? Yeah, it's too late now, isn't it? Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that they might have, that, that, that they might have, that ye might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. Paul's saying here, you know, um, he's saying you can't just be right or acting right when I'm around. You got to this has got to be uh, committed to this all the time. You got to be committed to the truth all the time, not just when I'm there. You know, it's amazing how many times when, you know, uh, uh, now, a number of years ago, there were some guys going around doing some really squirrely stuff. This is back in the, this is back in the 80s. They were going around preaching a lot of things on warring tongues, screaming at devils. I mean, screaming at the devil in tongues, and, uh, supposedly in tongues, until they were hoarse, couldn't even talk. And, um, and uh, they, they had the favor of Brother Summerall at the time, but what we found out later was that whenever Brother Summerall was around them or in their meetings, they didn't do it. They did it. They completely acted a different way. So people say, Brother Summerall, they're doing it. No, he'd go to the meeting and they wouldn't do it. And so he never saw them doing it. And, you know, so he thought maybe people were just being, you know, being hard or jealous or whatever. You, you, you don't know. And the truth of the matter was, when he was there, they acted one way. When he wasn't, they acted another and Paul's saying the same thing. You shouldn't just be zealously affected by these things when I'm with you. It should be that way always. The Word of God should be affecting you all the time, not just when I'm around. Amen? Shouldn't, you know, <laughs> listen, I remember as a kid, I'm telling you right now, if, if found out somebody from the church was coming to visit us, we, you know, churches would do that, denomination churches especially, if you, if you go to the Sunday school or whatever, and you're not a real, you're not always there or whatever, the, 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 the visitation team will come get you on some days. They'll come visit your house. Brother Moore, Brother Moore was on the way over one time. They called and said, well, we're going to come visit y'all on the way over. Just come visit, you know, whatever. And we all washing the car in the front yard. It's a Sunday. Youngins, get that car out of the front yard and clean it all up. So-and-so from the church is coming. Or granny was coming. You know, Pentecostal grandmama going to come over. I mean, you had to get everything straightened out like you hadn't been doing. I mean, I mean... Lay down like you have, have somebody fanning you because you ain't done nothing it's Sunday. Before you find out we're coming, you're out weeding the flower bed, cutting the grass and everything. All right? Now, but when somebody's coming, you got to straighten up. Then Paul was saying here, don't, don't be affected by the gospel only when I'm in your presence. You should be affected by it all the time. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Paul's Paul saying here is, you're not walking out the way you're supposed to be walking this out. And I'm praying and interceding and travailing in intercession for you until Christ, the anointing, is formed in you and you're living this on a consistent and regular basis. Amen. I desire to be present with you. Now, and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. In other words, he doesn't want to speak to them harshly. He wants to be able to speak to them in, a, in, in uh, sincere and beloved tones. But they're acting like idiots. He even said so, according to Phillips. Oh, you dear idiots of Galatia. Just tell me. Ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written, what, in the law, that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondmaid and the other by the free woman. Amen. Now, here, here, is, here is this. There is, a lot, there, there is a way to live after the flesh, and there is a way to live after the spirit. And Paul begins this allegory here. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one that from Mount Zion, which genereth to bondage, which is Agar. What? That was birth of the flesh. That was the, that was the Ishmael. That was an attempt to achieve what God had promised by faith by a work of the flesh. Are you here? 
Agar, Ishmael, and then Ishmael, the offspring of Ishmael. Hagar in the, you know, old, uh, the, uh, Hebrew. Abraham attempted to bring to pass by the flesh, which that which God commanded and de declared that could only come by promise. And here's, here's, here's where Paul is trying to get to. We cannot achieve by the flesh what God has given to us by promise. All right? <clears throat> For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, which ans is answereth, to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Thank God. But as then he was born after the flesh, persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are children of the bond, not of the bondman woman, but of the free. Now here Paul is beginning to break, the, break it down and say this. We people who are in Christ are there as children of promise. That it is by faith and not by sight. The just shall live by faith and not by sight. The children of the flesh, those who try to achieve their salvation by works. Now again, this is where the, great, the, the, the radical grace people get off on error. Because they'll say that to the believer, once you're born again and serving God, you don't have to do anything because you're under grace. And that just simply is not true. Can I achieve a salvation by the works of the flesh? Absolutely not. Do I need to add anything to uh, my faith in Christ to become born again? Absolutely not. I declare him as my Lord. I believe that God raised him from the argue that you confess him as, your, as Lord. And you go back to Romans 10. That's where it is. You know, some people get upset. One translation says, you know, uh, uh, whom the Son shall set you free, shall be free indeed. One almost says, whom the Son will make free is free indeed. And I've had people get in almost fights over the word make or set. Two different translations. You're quoting from two different translations, meaning really the same thing. If the Son shall make you free, you'll be free. If the Son sets you free, you're free. All right? You make Jesus Lord or you declare the Lordship. How do you make Jesus Lord? Of your life. You make him Lord of your life by accepting his Lordship. Okay? Don't get into semantics. I see people get upset over semantics of, you can't make Jesus Lord. He's Lord. He is Lord, but he's not your Lord unless you let him be. So you make him your Lord by accepting him. We're talking semantics. So people get getting wars over semantics. Don't even get in a war over it. All right? The purpose is to get them saved. Now, I cannot achieve salvation by any action of the flesh that I'm adding to my faith in the fact that Jesus is Lord, God he raised him from the dead, I believe that, and I declare his lordship over my life. I confess him as Lord. That saves me. Faith in that. That and that alone is why I'm saved. Not because after I did that, I went out and gave a million dollars to the church. That I didn't sin for the next 30 days. That I did, you know, that gets me in. I am in the kingdom based on that and that alone. But because I'm in the kingdom and because his grace has come on me, I've been born again. And Ephesians says this when we'll get there to this eventually. Jesus, the Ephesians says we've been created in Christ Jesus unto good works. There are going to be things I do that are expressions of the faith, that to, of, the, of the salvation I received by faith when I confessed him as Lord. I became a new man and therefore my actions, my deeds, what I think, what I do, where I go should be expressions of what's already taken place. And for me to lie down and say I can commit fornication when anybody I want to because I'm under grace and it doesn't matter is erroneous. For me to say I don't have to go to church is erroneous. As a matter of fact, if you're born again, you should want to go to church. Amen. You should want to be with the brethren. Every time in the book of Acts when things got tough, they went to their own company. 
That's what you should be wanting to do. You should want, but see, we got all these boneheads out there t- attacking the church. Ten reasons why your people don't want to go to church. You know, you, you church people have your own culture. You're doggone right we got our own culture. You're supposed to have a different culture. We're to come out from the world and, not, and be separate and not touch not the unclean thing. In other words, our gatherings should be a place where we're strengthened, where we do have a common bond. I read one of a recent blog, why the church, you know, the church should be churchy. That's right, we're supposed to be churchy. And then when we get out there with the world, we're anointed with the Holy Ghost and power, and we bring life to them. And you don't talk buzzwords to the, to the lost. Amen? You preach Jesus to them. You share the gospel with them. You don't stand around and talk your, your, what you would say to somebody in church. I'm blessed coming in, going out, right when I sit down, when I rise up. You tell that to a sinner, they're going, huh? Yeah. That's not what you're supposed to be preaching. Repent, for the kingdom of God's come. Jesus is Lord. Receive him as your Lord. Amen. But Paul is writing, and if you take these scriptures out and put it in somebody's radical grace teaching, they, they're, they're, well, that's what the Bible says, but not in context. In context, he is addressing the era of, era of Judaizers attempting to make Christians add things to what they've done to be saved in Christ and under the guise that you had to do this in order to be fully saved. Yeah, you might have faith in Christ, but unless you're circumcised, you're not, you're, you're not really in. That's error. I didn't get saved because, you know, we, we didn't get saved for any other reason except... Jesus Christ, be the Lord of my life. I confess you as Lord. I believe God's raised you from the dead. I, I, I submit my life to you. In Jesus' name, glory to God, you're born again. And Paul says you can't go back and try to do, listen, see, here's some people, that throw the whole out. What one, one preacher said on television, that's one of the dumbest things you've ever heard. If we just get rid of the Old Testament, everything would be all right. Well, who do you think they were quoting in the new? When they said, as the scripture saith. It was that old thing you want to get rid of. Hello? Y'all with me? Y'all go home? No. He's saying you can't come in and have a faith in Jesus Christ and be born again by faith in Christ and then have to add something to that to be saved. Yet the New Testament tells you because of that, you're going to act a certain way or you should be. Can I get two amens? Ver, chapter 5, verse 1. I got 10 minutes here, so we're going to jump on and go for a ride. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Okay. I'm I'm free. Now, I have heard people use scriptures, pull like script like this right out of context and go right. See, I'm free. I'm free to do anything I want to do. I'm free. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ profits you nothing. Now, he's not, he's talking about if you're being circumcised for the purpose of finishing or completing your salvation, then Jesus didn't profit you anything. Hello? For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he's a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Now stop right there because people will take that and they'll run off with it. But understand what he's talking about. He is talking about, again, I'm going to hammer this because there's people out there who are listening to stuff and they, and they just take these scriptures out of context. He is again saying that if you have to go back and be, he, what they're doing is they were coming to Gentile Christians. Understand these Galatians were Gentile Christians. And telling them, yeah, you have believed on Jesus, but you've got to be circumcised. Hello? And Paul said, man, if you're doing that, you're under the law. If you think that adding circumcision to your faith in Christ will save you, then you're a debtor to the whole law. 
Not just a part of it. The Judaizers have entered in. They're, they're spying out your liberties. They're, they're robbing you of, your, of, of faith in Christ. He says, Christ became no effect unto you. Because you're really, if you're saved by circumcision, then you don't need Jesus. Amen. For though we, um, he says, you're fallen from grace. Why? Because you're trying to add a work to faith in Christ to complete your salvation. That's what he's saying here. He's not saying that we don't have to do anything under the, we don't have, we can do whatever we want to do because we're under grace. That's not what he's saying. He's saying if you're trying to complete your salvation or finish your salvation that started out with faith in Christ by adding something from the law to it, you have fallen from grace. That doesn't save you. All right? For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus Christ, see the circumcision avails anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Now he, he also says this later in the 6th chapter, and says that Christ Jesus neither circumcision avails anything, nor uncircumcision, but the new creature. Or the new creation. So, you know, we have to read the whole. All right? You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion comes not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have this confidence. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will become none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you, he shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. Now, so in other words, I don't know who exactly know who these people are, but they're entering and they're causing you trouble. Trouble. He says it doesn't matter if you're circumcised or not circumcision, but faith, which is working by love. And so the, the, the New Testament commandment is the law of love. Amen. And I, brother, if I preach circumcision, why do I suffer persecution? There, then is the offense of the cross ceased. The Paul says here, he, he says, you know, if I was going around preaching the circumcision, I wouldn't have any problem with these guys because they wouldn't be, they wouldn't, the offense of the cross would be gone because I'm preaching the law. But he's saying he's only preaching the cross. Paul said in one place this. He said this. I would know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. King James says save, which means accept. I would know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He says here that if I'm preaching circumcision, then the, the, the offense of the cross ceases. Why? Because you can do it. It, it offended those, those legalists who wanted to be able to do something on their own to save themselves. You can't save yourself. It is completely a work of grace on God's part that we receive by faith on our part. The completed redemptive work of Jesus Christ to save us. Now the next verse. Another one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I would they were even cut off from you which, well, which trouble a few. Now. When I first read that as a younger Christian, I thought he went mint cut off like had them removed or taken out of your midst. That's not what it says. I mean, I've even seen one translation that got a little more crude and just said this. I, if, they're, if they're going to be circumcised, go ahead and do everything. Cut everything off. That's what he's saying. If circumcision will save you, I mean, you know, just go ahead and whack and be really saved. That's what he said there. That's what he really said. I know it's a little crude, but, you know, King Jimmy dresses it up sometime, and we kind of miss it in the church. But that, I mean, he was blunt. When they read this from the Greek, it was blunt. It was straightforward. Because if you say, here, man, if circumcision saves you, I mean, I mean, dismembering will really save you. I mean, he was talking about sex change operations before they were popular. I know, I, I know this. I know it sounds a little crude, but that's what it said. Yeah, emasculate. There you go. That was, that's, even a, that's a modern dressed up version. Okay. And we'll leave it there. All right? Maybe we won't. No, I'm going to leave it there. I promise I'm going to leave it there. For brethren, ye have been called to liberty. Stop. We've been called to what? I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. Only not use your liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Stop. Look and listen. <laughs> you know, 
that little, that little kind of jingle thing, stop, look, and listen. I forgot how it went now. We are called to liberty. Only use not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. What does that mean? That means you can't run around like a dodo brain and go, I'm under grace, I can do anything I want to, and it doesn't affect my salvation. Paul said you're free, but do not use your freedom to cater to your flesh. That's what he just said. He said, but by love, serve one another. Did you know walking in the Spirit and living a holy, godly lifestyle is service to other people? Why? Because they're watching your life. The Bible says that we're living epistles known and read of all men. People are watching you when you don't think they're watching you. I always like to use this example. Sorry. We had somebody in the church at one time and somebody else in the church at one time and they were riding down the road and one of them cut off the other with their car and they flipped them off. And the person that, got, that flipped off the other person got a call from the person that flipped them off. I mean to the person that flipped them off and said, hey brother, appreciate that. It was somebody else that knew them who was in the church. You're probably being watched. They didn't realize it, so they just kind of got out of an angry moment or whatever. You know, we all get, we get upset when people cut us off. I, I mean, I'm, I'm like, I don't flip them off, but I get upset sometimes. Especially some bozo pulls in front of you, and you have to slam the brakes to keep from hitting them. You know, and all your family's in there. You, you can get frustrated, but you don't flip, I don't, I've never flipped anybody off. All right? I, now I know a girl, with O'Brien's was open up here on, on uh, High Point Road, the, before the move, the, the first one, the other one that was, that building's been torn down now. Um, but when they were in there, there was a waitress there, and she was a sweet waitress, but she was coming down the road, and this guy cut her off, and she flipped him off. Well, he came off the road. He was a Marine. He kicked her window in. You don't, you don't just flip people off. <laughs> now, he got in trouble because she got his license number and called the state, tro state troopers, called his base, and they got his sergeant and told his sergeant what happened. And uh, she hadn't gotten home, but for the next hour and a half before she got home, every five minutes, there was a phone call from him. <laughs> his, his, his sergeant had, had been up in his grill. <laughs> but it was, she shouldn't have flipped him off. Now, I don't know how I got off on that. But by law, sir, we're, we're to love and serve one another in love. I, I, I know how I got in that because people are watching you. You don't know when they're watching you, you know. There are people watching you sometimes, and you only know they're around. They don't tell you they're around. Except they tell you later on, yeah, I saw you over such and such, such and such, doing such and such. Really? Amen. We're to, love, we're to, we're to, we're to walk in the, the law of love. We're to serve one another. Amen. As, as Christians in Jesus Christ. But he says here, we have been called to liberty, but that liberty is not an excuse to you go to the flesh. We are not the given an occasion to the flesh. For all the law is fulfilled in this one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, when we're walking in the law of love, everything else should come into place. Amen? you love your neighbor, you won't steal from your neighbor. You won't go sleep with his wife or sleep with her husband. Hello. You won't do, you won't do things that, were, that are egregious and hurt them and cause damage to them if you walk in love towards them. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed of one another. This I say then. Now wait a second now. Listen to this. Walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, the grace, extreme grace people teach you're under grace. It doesn't matter what you do. You don't have to do anything because you're under grace. Paul says you've got to walk in the spirit. Why? Because you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh if you walk in the spirit. You do, you do not automatically walk in the spirit. How do you know? Because he told us to. If we automatically, pop, here, I am telling you, there's a lot of Bible we wouldn't have to read if everything was automatic. 
As a matter of fact, the whole New Testament would be something like this. Except Jesus is Lord, see you in heaven. Everything else is taken care of. You're going to automatically do it all. You're going to witness. You're going to, you're going to love God. You're automatically going to not sin. Everything's, I mean, if that, was, if that was the truth, that's what that, that would be our whole New Testament. It'd be the shortest book in the Bible. The whole New Testament. But the fact of the matter is, there is flesh to deal with. There are minds to be renewed. You've got to put your body under. You have to train yourself to walk in the Spirit and be sensitive to God. You have to grow up in Christ. It doesn't happen automatically. Yes, you will grow if you're born, but if you don't get the right nutrients and, and so forth and get the right types of food as you're growing, you won't grow up healthy. And think, same thing is true spiritually. If you don't get the right spiritual food, you'll grow up unhealthy spiritually. So we need the right kind of spiritual food. What is that? Well, one of the things is that pastors are obligated to teach, and, and really all ministers are. You're not called to sell books and to teach a hot, cool message that everybody gets happy about throws money in your ministry. You're to teach things that mature the body of Christ. That help them grow healthy and whole. And add traveling ministries that go into churches. You're called to help add to the work of the local pastor to help that congregation grow and be healthy. Not just give them a message that makes them makes happy and clappy and offering big. You're supposed to be adding to what's going on there. You're to be adding to what they're receiving in their life and helping undergird them with truth. Now it's fine if it's a message on prosperity or a message on healing if that's adding to and helping them. But a lot of times people want to preach stuff that, that makes everybody happy, but doesn't help them grow. And there's messages going on now about grace. It just makes everybody happy, but it's not helping them grow. It's hurting them. They're not maturing because of it. They're actually digressing because of it. And then pastors start preaching, and everybody gets mad at them. Gets mad because you're preaching. You're preaching. I have to do something. I ain't going to do nothing. I'm under grace. I'm leaving your church. I'm going to go follow so-and-so on the Internet. Then if you're in a car wreck or something, you'd be calling me to come to the hospital and pray. And I will be there. Because that's what I'm called to do. I'm your pastor. I'm, I'm not going to leave you just because you got upset. The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are contrary to the one to the other. And so you, that ye cannot do the things that ye would. In other words, if you are not going to walk in the spirit, you're going to be living a struggle between the flesh and the spirit. And you will not be able to do things God's called you to do or God's told you to do. But if you're led by the spirit, listen to this. But if you be led by the spirit, you're not under the law. What's that mean to me? That if you're not going to be led by the Spirit, if you're going to follow out to the flesh, you're going to get under the law. And the demands of the law are going to be there. Now, I'm, not, I'm just not going to teach on this, but now the works of the flesh are manifest. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, that's homosexuality, by the way. Lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. In other words, this is not the full, complete list of all the works of the flesh. It's just the top nine. All right, it just covers. It, it just encompasses a, part, a lot of it. But things just things like that, things that are of the flesh, that are wrong and ungodly. Okay, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do or practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So do not tell me that you're under saved, you're under grace, and you can go out and just live any stinking way you want to live, and you're going to inherit the kingdom. The Bible says, Paul said, if you practice it, you're not going to inherit. Wow. Yeah. Say it backwards. Wow. Say it upside down. Wow. Mom. <laughs> All right. We're going to stop there. We're going to come out and cover some of this next week. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the 
giving online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.